Hello, I'm Amory Pierman, and I'm joined today by Bill Pettit. Um, Bill co-owns um, the Three Principles um, Intervention with his wife, and he mentors individuals, groups, and organisations. He's been certified in adolescent and geriatric psychiatry, and he was a physician in the US Navy for over nine years. Um, he's an educator in the Three Principles Understanding, and his latest course is called Hope for Helpers, Less Stress, More Joy, which you can join and um, I'll give details of that um, when I put this onto YouTube I'll include a link um, so welcome Bill nice thanks for coming yes good evening to all of you in the UK and it's morning here so uh, yeah late afternoon here <laughs> yeah yeah um, so I'd just like to um, start by asking you Bill what life was like to you before you met Sid Banks and came across the three principles understanding and how your life changed afterwards <laughs> How many days do we have? <laughs> as long as you like. <laughs> <laughs> you know, easy to to answer that what I what I see in the present moment is kind of superficially, you know, what what my um, what my experience was like day to day. But when you ask that, Anne Marie, and this is the first time that that it, this really happened in the moment. When you said what was your life like before and after you met Sid, what I heard was what was your view of the world before and after you met Sid? Because my view of the world, the way that I see the nature of what creation is and my nature and the connection between the two, I would say determines my day-to-day -day experience. <laughs> so from that perspective, before I met Sid Banks, my experience of what was behind creation was a, a being from which I was separate, had no direct connection to, a being that was full of judgment, held on to grudges, and was willing to do something that no parent would do would be to punish its children forever with severe torment. And I was given pointed to materials that, that were quote infallible that said that. <clears throat> so I would say the first thing is that I lived in fear from a very young age. No one does very well when they're acting out of fear. Never met that person. I experienced Second thing that comes to mind in this moment, and this is kind of all fresh for me. So the second thing that comes to mind to me is that that my experience was created by things external to me. Circumstances, people, what people said, what people did. 
So again, I woke up every morning disempowered because if you asked me, do you, do you think you'll have a good day today? I'd say, I don't know. Because it depended very little on me. It depended on what happened that day and what other people said and did. And it even depended on how much I was um, attracted to and gave attention to things that had happened even many years ago that no longer existed except as a thought. And to things that had not occurred but might occur that I would worry about possibly happening. It was as if every morning I, the metaphor that's come to mind frequently is Pinocchio. I was a puppet. I handed out strings unknowingly. Life had a string. What I thought God was had a string. People had a strings. And then when they jerked on their strings, I did my dance, my fearful dance or my angry dance or my righteous, arrogant dance. I love Sid's statement that I love, I mean, I think, I think this simple man was allowed a peek into the mind of what we call God as big as any peak that anybody's ever had. That's my own, that's just my own assessment. I, I love where he says, you know, when the answer is complicated, it's the intellect. When the answer is simple, it's the spirit. I didn't know simple. I wasn't aware of simple. I didn't know in my heart that the, although at some level I would have glimpses that made me think that truly that the default setting was for all humanity was love and understanding. And that it was only fear that takes us away from love and understanding. I used to say in 1987 or 88, I actually made a set of videos <clears throat> and one was insecurity and ego, the pain magnets. But even that complicates it because you can't have in insecurity and ego or the need to prove oneself without fear. There'd be no need for it. The third thing that comes to mind is um, my lack of awareness of the resources that I had as a human being. My son just turned 44. He's a beautiful, beautiful man. He's got twin girls that just turned eight and twin boys that just turned six. They're, 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 they bring, you know, they exude joy, beauty. He uh, owns a construction company and remodeling. And his van, I think there's, I think maybe it's more now, but I think there's 35 to 40,000 
dollars worth of tools in his Pettit construction and remodeling van. Metaphorically, for 41 years of my life until I met Sid Banks on April Fool's Day, which is kind of funny, 1983, I drove around with a van to deal with life's building. And all I had in it was um, a hammer. I had one tool, which is a metaphor for analysis. Because I thought the only way that I could deal with life when I didn't understand what to do, which was most of the time, was to figure it out, was to go to analytical thinking and to keep doing it, even though it led me most of the time to confusion, to um, mood lowering, mood, mood lowering, anxiety raising, confusion. If that's all you have, you know, if, if, if that's all you think you have is a hammer, the, you just go looking for nails, you know. <clears throat> Some of you, I'm sure, that have heard me speak before, I love the statement from the, and I, I block on his name, it may come to me even as I tell the story. Many, many years ago, probably 30 years ago now, there was a movie called Sleeper. Are you familiar with that movie, Anne-Marie? No? I can't say his name right now, but he, he's often the, he was often the director and the prime um, actor in his movies. And in this movie, he awakened after 25 years of being asleep. And when he realized that he'd been asleep for 25 years, his first words <clears throat> were the following. 25 years. Hell, I could have been halfway through my analysis. Come on, guys, smile a little bit. I know it's late in the day in UK and it's not British humor, but give me a freaking break here. Give me a smile at least. 25 years. Hell, I could have been halfway through my analysis. I guess. Is it the, pretty, huh? I was going to say, I um, guess that you're the joke there is that people are never up through with, the, with their analysis. It's a whole lifetime well, of analysis. Yeah. You see, analysis is wonderful when it's needed. I'm not saying analysis is terrible. There are instances, if I'm going to catch a flight to across the Atlantic to the UK from here in Phoenix, <clears throat> and I'm headed for the airport, and I have to go to the airport, I I have to figure out how long I have to be there before the flight, two hours. I have to figure out what time of day my flight is. So it's a city of uh, 7 million people and the, the traffic is different at different times of day and night. Um, I have to make, probably add 30 minutes just in case there is an accident that I have a chance to still, still make it to the airport in time. So I'm not upset and thinking that the accident caused me in, instead of my piss poor planning, right? Um, so that, the, the, you know, so I, I, there's some analytical thinking there. If I'm blessed enough, which I, you know, there are people that, that I have met that have been blessed enough with making huge amounts of money so that they could sit down at 25 or 30 and go to the banker and have the banker use the analytical formula, how much would I have to put away each year, given the present understanding of inflation, to have the equivalent of this amount of money in, in today's money at this time at whatever year, 
when I'm 50, would turn 55. And then they can, they can, anal the analysis of that data. My, I have a daughter who's actually a data analytic, uh, a data analyst, and, uh, but she's an illustrationist. She's a specializes and one of the founders of the International Society of Data Analytics and Illust Illustration. So there's not that there's more and more data that's being collected and there's nothing wrong with an analysis of that. But my experience of life before I met Sid was that I spent about 96% of my life in analysis and maybe about four or 5% of it looking for something else that I didn't, I suppose I called it being raised Catholic, the Holy Spirit. I now spend, I'd say that to me, there's about 4% of life that lends itself to analysis and about 96% of life <clears throat> that lends itself to being in the present moment with a light heart, with a joyful heart and a loving heart. When Sid says love and lightheartedness is to mental illness, or I would say to, you could even say to mental stress, distress, love and lightheartedness is to mental stress as Sunlight and dry as to fungus. It eradicates it, keeps it from even occurring. It's both a vaccine and a and a cure. So that's what my life was like before. And as a result, it was difficult. Every day was a struggle. I probably spent at least 40% of every day in the past with regrets, guilt. I used to call them the Uda sisters, but I realized how misogynist that was. So I call them the Uda people now. Shoulda, woulda, and coulda. And their cousins, gender neutral cousins, uh, um, might have been and was gonna. And I spent another 40% of my day, as best as I can remember, in the future, worrying about things that had not existed, that hadn't occurred yet. Now, there's nothing wrong with planning, it, being in the present moment with a light heart and looking at things and making plans based on what you see. That's there's nothing wrong with that. That's very different from worry. Very different. Buying, looking and seeing that you're 30 years old and you've got a wife and three children and you say, you know, I should have some life insurance so that if something happens to me that, and my wife should too, if something happens to her, I'm going to be, you know, that's, that's called planning. That's being in the present moment and seeing what to do. That's different than worry. Some of you have probably heard me say that if I, if I ever invent something, but you know, I'm in my 80th year, so who knows whether I'm going to invent anything. But if I do invent something, um, I, I'm going to hire the team that marketed worry. Because that's a group of brilliant people. I don't know who they are, but I'm sure I could find them because they have marketed one of the most destructive habits to people's physical, psychological, emotional, and spiritual well-being as a badge of courage. Of course I worry. It shows that I'm a caring person. E Bullshit. And I... I, there's no blame there. I know that sounded kind of judgmental, but because I did it for years. On the other hand, a marketing team that's gotten very little publicity and, and has not done very well, frankly, is the, 
the, the marketing team for contentment. Happiness and contentment, that, that marketing team has not done well. I mean, if you meet somebody and say, how are you? And you say, God, I just feel a full of happiness, contentment, and gratitude. And, and your, your brain goes, yeah, lazy bastard. <laughs> you're, not, you're obviously not in life. <laughs> you don't understand how serious this is. <laughs> so, <laughs> so what happened when I met Sid and started? Well, and the other thing was that I had been going, and you, many of you have heard this, because of what I just told you, my, my level of understanding, I went in and out of depression for 20 years from age 21 to 41. And I thought my depression was caused by, in some order, my genetic makeup. I had depression on both sides of my family, alcoholism on both sides of my family, suicide on one side of my family, and in recent years on the other side. I thought it was caused by my genes, my, the, couple of small things that compared to most people in life that I thought were quote traumatic in my childhood that happened 40 had happened 35 years before. I had no idea and it or from my parents frailty of not being perfect human beings. I had no idea that it was created by me innocently, please hear that underlined, innocently misusing three universal gifts that point to the nature of what's behind life and how human experience is created. Everything is created moment to moment six to nine hours a day, metaphorically, of doing this. And then at the end of the day saying, gee, the hell's going on? I've got another one of those damn right-sided headaches. Occasionally, it would be a left-sided headache. Now, that's funny. I thought, I had no idea. I had no idea. And... The key, I think, is to, as Elsie Spittle says, to move to a place of understanding through, through realizations from a divine consciousness that we're, that we're made of, where we can take responsibility for our experience without the burden of guilt. There's a difference between being able to take responsibility versus beating the crap out of ourselves. I'm gonna end here in about at least a couple of minutes. I'm not, saying this is a should for anybody else. But for me, incrementally, believe me, even in the last three weeks, I've had insights that changed. It looked like the world changed. And that's exciting to me. When Sid said, you know, there's an infinite number of doors of understanding of these principles. That's a really, really, really big number. And I did a podcast for somebody last evening that, that, that and, and, uh, and again, I, this could be inferred as judgmentalness. I, I hope and ask that whatever judgmentalness there is within me is, is, is not there because I don't think I generally feel it. But I see so many people that go looking other places and they think it's because the principles, the understanding of the principles doesn't give sufficient answers. But to me, 
it's just because I haven't gone through enough of those doors yet. I don't, ha I don't feel a need to look anywhere else. There's something inside of me that draws me here that this is where truth is. It's, it's a metaphor. The principles, you'll never find the metaphors in a box. They're words, they're a form, they're attempting to describe, point to what Sid saw when he said, I'm home free, I've seen what people call God is, I've seen what life is, and I've seen how the two are connected. And they're an attempt to try to point. And if we look, keep looking at somebody's finger who's pointing somewhere, we will not see where that person is pointing. So life is pretty simple for me these days. If I feel, and the other thing is that came to me last night is that this people say sometimes I'm having trouble getting other people to see that it's 100% from the inside out. Well, here's the deal. If you're trying to convince anybody of something, lots of luck. But if you understand how a system works, then you understand that there's obvious truths relate. You know, the Pythagorean theorem where the square of the hypotenuse in a right-sided triangle equals the sum of the squares of the other two angles. That's just a, that's a geometric truth. And there's about 20 corollaries that are obvious truths that come from that. Well, to me, to the degree that I truly understand and I'm not saying that I truly understand them, that I get to some level of understanding of the nature of these principles, I have a realization that there is nothing external to me that has the power to directly take away my state of well-being. So that if I am in that state of emotional pain, I don't blame myself. But I don't look outside of myself for who's causing it. <laughs> I know that innocently I am the one, that, that the only person that can do that is in the same underpants I'm in. <laughs> and the last I looked, there's only room for me. And I wish they were a couple of sizes lower than they were, but that's the way it is right now. It's reassuring because I don't waste time looking anywhere else. I know that all I have to do, people the other day, somebody asked me, what do you do when you're in the midst of a thought thunderstorm? And I had one of those moments where what came out my mouth was not from me, it was coming through me. I just went to quiet and what came out my mouth was, when I am a th in a midst of a thought thunderstorm, I do the best that I can to be where I am. Very simple. I don't try to do anything. And why don't I try to do anything? Because I know that to me, my mental well being is like a, a fair sized cork. And if you have a fair sized piece of cork, it takes a fair amount of effort to keep it underwater. And I have the power to do that. And I can get triggered and caught up in my attractiveness of my own personal thinking. Instead of listening to the divine wisdom that's trying to guide me every moment. But as soon as I do the best I can to get where I am, there is something powerful about being in the present moment that slips your hands off the cork without effort. And once the cork has nothing pushing it down, it does not need a GPS to know where the surface is. It goes there effortlessly and rapidly. And that's what's happened incrementally over 38 years, inch by inch. And again, Direction is the key. Be gentle with yourselves, please. Be grateful for every inch you move in the right direction. 
and the movement will continue to happen effortlessly. And your honor, that's my case. And I'm standing for it. I rest my case. Well, that's as best as I could do, Maria. And Maria. <laughs> my, my dog's being very at the moment at the moment and barking and speaking his her toy. <laughs> no, I, I think your dog's just cheering. It's, it's, it's <laughs> clapping. It's clapping. I'm I've heard it is clapping. <laughs> <laughs> about taking responsibility for our experience without the guilt that kind of just struck a chord with me and I just would love to hear more about that well sometime when you get Elsie you could probably ask her but <laughs> no I'll, I'll tell you what I what I hear from that um you know when I when I realized that I had been and it yeah, something happened within the thir first 30 minutes of sitting in the presence of Sid Banks. Something happened profoundly that lifted at least 300 pounds of metaphorical pressure off my chest and back. Because I really thought um, that I was broken, Linda, that there's something lacking. And ironically, when I saw that I was the architect of my 21 years of depression, <laughs> that innocently I had been activating the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis and lowering my mood and creating dis-ease in my body and at times disease in my body. I, I had nothing, I felt nothing but compassion for myself. I didn't feel what a stupid idiot I was. I didn't feel, you know, God, I, I am dumb. I'm, you know, I, I am lacking. I am broken. No, I had compassion like you would have for a, well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you <laughs> what comes to mind when I was six and I was three and I have a, two beautiful brothers and I had, three beautiful sisters. I lost one in COVID about 18 months ago. But I was six and I was three and we were on vacation with six kids. Well, at that time, maybe if he was only three, maybe only four or five. And my dad handed my little three-year-old brother a Coke, one of those big old thick glass Coke bottles with a straw. And he was drinking on the, he drinking in the Coke bottle and then he thought, you know, it'd be a lot easier if I just held on to the straw. So he let go of the Coke bottle and just took the straw and was in utter amazement as the shattered glass and the Coke spread all over this concrete floor. And when I looked at my little brother, all I felt was compassion because as a six-year-old, I knew enough about I understood gravity and I knew what you had to hold on to the bottle. And I had nothing but compassion for him that, that, that he was in the middle of a mess right now because he, he just didn't understand that. I felt that same compassion for me when I saw that I was doing this six to nine hours a day and then wondering why I was going in and out of clinical depression. That even when I wasn't depressed, Depression, metaphorically, to me, was like a black cloud, a very good-sized black cloud that stayed about two feet behind me as I walked. And if it had a voice, it would have said, pet it, don't get arrogant about not being depressed, because I can have your ass any time I want it. So when I saw that I was the agent of that depression, that cloud disappeared. There were no strings, nothing had power over me. The power was within me and I might misuse it at times, but there was a direction of understanding that as I understood more, I would do it less often. I would do it for shorter periods of time. 
and I, and I wouldn't cause as much pain for myself before I woke up. All three of those things were exciting. There was, there was nothing to burden myself with guilt. Uh, the last thing I'll say about it, and then I want to see if I've answered your question at all, is every two things. One is every moment of my life to me is, is a second chance second chance if i just burned a cookie i can't unburn that cookie but i can make a fresh cookie and not burn it got a chance so so i guess what i'm saying is i tell people when we come out of and this was my lesson when I come out of the cave in the darkness into the light, I have a choice between two G's. One is I can turn back and look into the cave of darkness with guilt and beat the shit out of myself for all the things that I broke and knocked over when I was in darkness. Or I could turn around the other way towards maybe at the beginning, just a little bit of light and be filled with gratitude that I've got some light in my life. And my experience is that the more I have gratitude, that ratio of guilt to gratitude, the more that gratitude is on top, the lighter and lighter and lighter, the more light I get into my life. So I know, is that helpful at all? I don't oh, know. I, it's really, um sort of struck a chord with me I think the self-compassion piece in of course there really really did I, I had a similar experience with anxiety that I hadn't realized I was carrying so much or experiencing so much of and through habitual thinking and patterns and everything and suddenly when I heard something as, as is par for the cause I don't even remember exactly what was said but something touched me in that moment and it went um, and I think the bit that was missing for me was that self-compassion. There was relief <laughs> and I was really grateful for that. But I then turned it back on myself. How could I have been so stupid? Right. Because we see I, what we, nothing I'm, exists for us until we see it. Right. Mm, we see what it. we see when we see it. Yeah. 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 I think because yeah. I'd always tried to intellectualize everything. I'd always tried to understand so it seemed so simple. Why didn't I know this? I sort of turned it against myself for a short while until I knew better. But I think that self-compassion piece is really powerful. So thank you for... Yeah, we're, we're doing the best. Every, it, it allows you to have compassion for other people. It doesn't mean that there's some people you don't trust to watch your children or, <laughs> or, or, or stay in your house over the weekend. But that doesn't mean you don't have to have compassion for them because they're lost they're lost in they're lost to only hurt people hurt people and so compassion for yourself i think compassion starts at home charity does start at home but you start to see other people through eyes of compassion and you and you you know you it, it changes that like sid says every time you have an insight it will appear to you that the world out there has changed Many, I won't go through the whole story, but may, how many of you have heard me tell the story about my dad and his road rage? Mm -hmm. No? Uh, no. So. Well, maybe I will tell it then. Because <laughs> my dad, my mom was always afraid. Of course, when I was gro grown up, she had, people had this image of God as some person that was ready to punish people. And, and, uh, and this was before four lane highways. And here he is with six kids in a, in a station wagon and somebody would come over the two lane highway into our lane and he'd have to turn. And as he turned, he was famous for saying, you son of a bitch. And my mother was always feared that would be his last words and he would be held accountable as, as a bad thing. And, uh, but there continued to be son of a son of a bitches on the road, wherever he went. And when they came and moved down to live with us after he retired, and my late wife, Sue, and I in Florida, they, we were in Bradenton and, and 45 minutes away, well, 45 to 50 minutes in the winter and 
25 minutes in the summer when there weren't all the snowbirds coming down from the north. They would go down on Wednesdays and visit with my brother, who was an optometrist, and he would take a two hour lunch and they would drive down there and uh, and spend two hours. And my dad was so upset with those sons of bitches that he enjoyed about 15 minutes of that two hour visit because he'd finally recover for about 15 minutes in joy. And then about 15 minutes before he was going to have to drive through those sons of bitches. <laughs> He started and his heart and his shoulders hurt. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> had to take his arthritis medicine. So I came home one day. They were coming to a program that I was doing. This is 1987 uh, in Bradenton, Florida. And I was doing a, a series of six two-hour things for the general public for free called Less Stress, More Joy. And my parents had come to at least three of those. I think three of them. And uh, so I came home that Wednesday from work and I went to their living room. We had, a, I had two small children uh, and, and two bigger ones, but so we had a separate, they had our own separate living room. So I said, mom, how was your visit to see John today? She said, Bill, it was wonderful. We, and we had about 18 E's, which I knew included my father, had a wonderful time. I said, really? She said, and then my mom was a little petite lady and she had these sparkling blue eyes. And then she kind of, like she was telling a, a CIA or M, 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 M6, is it? Or a, a secret, you know, she'd say, you know, there were no SOBs on the road today. I said, mom, that's impossible. I know that road, it's full of this. She said, no, you ask your father. There were none today. So I look over and my father's reading the newspaper. He was a big... He was one hell of a foot American football player in college back in the 30s. He was a powerful man, even in his 70s. And he's reading the newspaper, and um, I can see him smiling. And he, he's had, he had these ruddy cheeks. He he heard what was going on. So I said, Dad, I said, what's this about? You had a really nice visit today. She said, he said, Bill. And they've been going down there every Wednesday for at least five, six months. I never realized how beautiful that drive is. I never realized how beautiful that drive is. The scenery. Why? Because he got present. He got out of his thoughts. As my late wife said, there's only two places. She saw this, the principles, much deeper than I quicker than I. In 1984, she looked at me and she said, Bill, I realize there's only two places to be in life moment to moment. I said, what's that, honey? She said, I'm either, either in my life, which is wondrous, or I'm in my thoughts. Wow. My dad got in his life for a change and he realized how beautiful it was. So then then I played the devil's advocate. I said, yeah, but what's this nonsense mom's talking about? No SOBs. And he said, well, there wasn't any today. I said, dad, were there people that tailgated where I went through the turn without signaling, got too close to your rear end, da, 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 da. we're 90 some years old going 30 miles an hour in a 50 mile an hour zone. He said, well, there were a few of those. And I said, how many? He said, well, 25 or so. 25 to 30 up and back. And I said, dad, you, those were the sons of bitches. And he got real quiet. He didn't thank me for what he'd learned in the series or anything. He just looked at me, he said, you know, that isn't what I saw today. What I saw was human beings just like myself who were paying too much attention to their thinking and not enough to their driving. And I said a prayer for them wow. that they would make it home safe without being hurt themselves or hurting anybody else. Wow. And what came to me was Sid says, when you have an insight from love and understanding, which is what God is, what people call God is pure love and understanding. 
when you have an insight from that connection to that in your heart, in your consciousness, it will appear to you that the world external to you has changed. My dad did not learn how to cope with sons of bitches on the road. They disappeared. And what he saw were beautiful human beings doing the best that they could, just like he was. Doesn't mean you don't watch out for those people <laughs> and drive defensively, but you don't have to feel anger, which really when people feel anger, it's just their fear that they might get injured and or their family might get injured. It's always love is letting go of fear. So I hope that was helpful. Beautiful. Lovely. That was really lovely. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Bill, when you were talking earlier, you were talking about depression. And I was it came to me while you were talking about you can have a label that I'm depressed and you can think you're that label or other people are labels. Have you got anything you can say about labels? Well, there are attempts to describe where a person is. They have nothing to do with who a person is. I thought I was a depressive. I thought it was part of who I was. It was where I was spending six to nine hours a day giving attention to negative thinking and worry, guilt, resentment, upset, overanalyzing, unresolved grief, and dysregulating my whole system, and then responding to the dis-ease that I was creating with more upsetting thinking. <laughs> so, you know, I, you've, have you heard me say Dr. Tom Ensel's quote? Dr. Tom Ensel was the national director of the National Institute of Mental Health from 2005 to 2017 in the United States as psychiatrist. Now, his answer to what he says would be different from my answer, but here's what he said in 2012, about halfway during his tour as psychiatrist and head of the National Institute of Mental Health. We are so embedded in this structure, we have spent so much time diagnosing mental disorders that we actually believe they are real. Pardon me? Pardon me? It's the director of the National Institute of Mental Health. But there's no reality. They're just constructs. There's no reality to schizophrenia or depression. We might have to stop using terms like depression and schizophrenia because they are getting in our way and confusing things. Wow, wow, wow. Whatever we've been doing for five decades, it ain't working. And when I look at the numbers, the numbers of suicides, the numbers of disabilities, the mortality data, it's abysmal. And it's not getting any better. All of the ways in which we've approached these illnesses and with a lot of people working very hard, the outcomes we've got to this point are pretty bleak. Now, I'm not an anti-psychiatry and I'm not an anti-medicine, but we recently had an article in the American Journal of Psychiatry that surveyed 2016 American psychiatrists, and I applaud their humility and their honesty, 78% of them met criteria for burnout. 78% of American psychiatrists who people are going to during the pandemic and during life's challenges to not take on stress and create stress in the face of life's very, life's very real challenges. 
don't know how to do that themselves. So what do we turn to? We turn to medications, right? I encourage people to read Anatomy of an Epidemic, Magic Bullets, Psychiatric Drugs, and the Astonishing Rise of Mental Illness in America. This man does not have a, 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 an anger for psychiatry. He's an, an award-winning investigative journalist who went into the basements of, of uh, Harvard's medical school and started looking at research over the last 60 years. Sid said to somebody that was having to take some pills, he said, he said that, that pill is God too. It's not that the pill is bad. That pill is God too. But, but you have to know what its use is. Its use is if somebody is so terrified with panic attacks that I need to stop their panic attacks when I was in the private of um, if somebody's asking the name of the book again, I'll send it to you, Anne Marie. Okay. That um, I'm sorry, I got that some that popping up took me away from where I was. Do you remember what what I was saying? You were saying about um, how a tablet can be God too, so a pill. Oh yeah, that that, that 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 when somebody is is full of fear and having panic attack after panic attack. I used to use strong part. I used to use high doses that shocked people because I wanted them to get quieted down to where they could listen. If somebody was hallucinating and didn't know that hallucinations were just thoughts with special effects and they were terrified by the voices that were saying, I'm gonna kill you. If you don't kill yourself, we're gonna kill you. I would do whatever I had to hit them with to, to stop, slow down that system to give them a chance to hear something. But here's the deal. I'll just show you one of these. Three studies by the World Health Organization showed that in countries like Uganda and places, third world countries that can't afford to give their people with schizophrenia, with the label of schizophrenia, long-term medicines. They can only give it at the beginning for a few weeks to get them settled. And then they love the hell out of them, even without the principles, which that's what the love, that's what the principles are, love. And after seven and a half years in these undeveloped countries, 42 to 45% of people are completely cured. And 73% are fully employed. Whereas in the United States, Russia, and Europe, where people can afford to give these medicines on an ongoing basis, it's five to 6% versus 42%, 700% increase. And he shows how that's true for anxiety, for depression, for every thing we call mental illness, that over time, the medications, people get worse. Why? If you understand, at least the, my understanding of the principles as divine mind being 100% love and understanding, totally benevolent, totally beneficent, then even the symptoms like Linda talked about her anxiety or me with my depression, those are love letters. They're trying to wake me up to the fact that I'm misusing the energy of life in a way that is harmful. It's a love letter. What we used to call symptoms are love letters. But if you don't understand that, You've got some troubles in your life. Your son's using cocaine or your mom's dying of breast cancer or your dad just got laid off or he's an alcohol, struggling with alcohol. And now you start worrying about that. And now your mood starts going down and your anxiety starts going up and your thinking gets befuddled. You think those are three more problems in your life. 
rather than love letters from divine mind trying to say, look in a different direction. For 41 years, I didn't know that. People are innocent. They're doing the best they know. But things we call psychiatric symptoms are love letters. They're trying to wake us up like the rumble strips on the side of the road, or the county road where we start to fall asleep and we hit the rumble strips and they save us from flipping over into the ditch and maybe dying. They're trying to wake us up. I started asking people that had manic episodes or hypomanic episodes. I said, started asking people and 75% I said, asked this question. Do you remember at all what thoughts, kind of thoughts you were having before you went into your mania or your hypomania? And about 75, 70 to 75% could remember. And what they said uniformly, they said, yes, I do. Suicide had become more and more of an option. Because people would say, how can a manic episode be a love letter? How could it be God, universal mind's way? It's a late one. But if you don't listen to the earlier ones, what does mania do? It gets you, it gets attention to people. <laughs> it gets the cavalry involved. Well, I don't know if they the cavalry in the UK, but it gets the police involved. It gets the health helpers involved and it gets you to a safe place. I had one man who his last thought that he remembered was since he felt like he had failed his family economically, he was going to kill his wife, his two beautiful daughters that he loved and then himself out of love so they would not have to live in this hell that we call life. His manic episode saved four people's lives. And it got him to me on a Sunday morning that I was on call at the hospital. And he, he, he's, he, he he was fine once because he saw, he saw. So all of these symptoms that we, that we think of as physical and emotional symptoms, they're, they're times for us to get as quiet as possible and listen. I'm aware, do we go till 30 after the hour? Is that right? Yes. And um, I'm just going to open it up to see if anyone's got any more questions. Trying to wake us up. Yeah, it changes Bill. everything. It's 180 degrees. Yeah. Love, yeah. Sorry, Bill. Yeah, I'd love to that. Resonate absolutely everything. Because yeah. I was that person, you know, jumped off uh, motorway bridge. Wow. Uh, wow. Safe by a policeman at the last minute. And then I came across the principal. So, wow. yeah. But yeah, thanks, Bill, for for your time today. Oh, thank you, thank you. Hannah's got her hand up. Sure. Hi there. Thanks, yes, Bill. Hannah. Um, it's wonderful. I, everything that you've said has resonated. I'm, I'm actually here with my two little girls. They've been they've been radiating closer and closer to the phone. <laughs> <as I was laughs> That's asking. cute. How so old they, are they? They're seven and ten. Okay. Yeah. So um. Yeah, it really resonates that last piece that you said about listening to your body. And actually, interestingly, when I switched the uh, the video on, the, the webinar on, you were speaking about tuning into your body and listening to your body, um, recognizing when you need to rest and uh, kind of done a full circle there, it feels. Um, the last couple of days, I've been really wiped out. I've been having some strange heart flutterers and big palpitations and uh, it's quite odd for me because I'm a I'm a picture of health usually um, but it's it's been a, an interesting couple of days because I've recognized it as signs to just slow down and to, to get quieter and uh, yeah. yeah so thank you thank you so much for well that's beautiful Hannah yeah that it it it, it always seemed more complicated than that rather than just slowing down from fast and furious to calm and curious. And another way of saying, just getting present, 
yeah and listening getting present and listening rather than trying to figure it out with our analytical thinking yes it's just about listening uh my friend Ofer Meyer I don't know if you know Anna Marie I'll, I'll send this too but on on YouTube there's a free course called um, it's called uh, um, The Missing Link for Veterans. And it is done, it's not just for veterans. Every when People have said this is for anybody that wants peace of mind. And it's Judy Sedgman and three soldiers, Ofer Meyer from Israel, Dave Hill from UK, and, and uh, Brad Gallup from the United States. And we went through The Missing Link one page at a time, all 142 pages. And at the end of each of the pages, we gave room for up to all five of us to comment. Not that we did on every page, but if there was, if that page had meant something to us, then we commented. So it's an incredible journey. Ofer Meyer was a survivor in the in in uh, what do you call it? In um, the Second uh, Lebanon War, where the other nine members of his company all died, many of them in his arms. He was the medic with his left eye hanging out by a cord. He went into severe depression. I met him in PTSD. I met him with Rabbi Haim Levine in Israel 13 days. I was there in 2008. He now is a psychologist. He now uh, serves uh, soldiers with PTSD and depression. Um, and he... Um, is uh, doing a two-year program uh, internship in child and adolescent psychology. And he and two friends walked out. How many of you heard me tell about what happened in Barcelona with Ofer? No? In the middle, of, and I'm going to do it quickly, but in the middle of, the, um, of, this, of this course, he, one time he came on and he and his two friends had gone to Barcelona for the weekend. And this was... 12 years after his experience, right? And he walked out of the airport and they didn't know it was a national holiday. And fireworks and explosions were going off in the air. And suddenly his heart was going 160. He was breathing heavily, he's profusely. But because he was not afraid of his experience, Sid supposedly said, if people were just not afraid of their experience, because it's the only experience you can have is a thought created one. So Sid, so most people would have gotten crazy, right? They would have started trying to fight their thinking and change it and uh, get away from it and reframe it. And, uh, instead, Ofer said, I knew all I had to do was to sit down and do nothing. And do nothing. Just be there. And within five minutes, my heart was normal. My breathing was normal. I was no longer perspiring. And I felt a deep level of calm within five minutes. And I looked up at the fireworks and I said, is this cool or what? And they went and had a wonderful weekend in Barcelona. They did not have to take the next plane back to Tel Aviv. They were not at the mercy of that experience. That may be a good place to stop. Yeah. We're, we're all drinking from the same well, folks. There is no one here that is more wise or less wise than any other, including me. We're all drinking from the same well. It's beautiful. I love you guys. Thanks Please. for being here. Love you too. Thank you so much for your Thanks, time, Bill. Love you lots. See you soon. Bye-bye. Thanks, Bo. Thank you. Beautiful children, Hannah. Thank I see you, you ladies. You. Bye. Three beautiful Bye. ladies. Three in one. That's beautiful. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. for having me, Anne-Marie. Thanks for your time, Bill. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. I'll send that stuff to you, Anne-Marie. I'll okay. make a note of it right now. And if I don't in 24 hours... Be the squeaky wheel, but I'm, oh. I'm going to write it down right now. Okay. Speak to you soon. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.
Okay, we did okay. We did fine. Yes. Um. So, sorry if we overran a bit. So. But, oh, no, yeah. no, 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 no. I'm. I'm. Uh, I, I'm a big boy. Good. <laughs> <laughs> you take care. You bye too. Bye bye. Bye. -bye.